Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens Adapted for Flowing Wells High School by Christopher L. Pankratz Performed by the Caballero Players Stave 1 Marley's Ghost Marley was dead to begin with There was no doubt whatever about that the register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good upon exchange for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. <laughs> Mind, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it, or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole friend, and sole mourner. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. But he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. But he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. Nobody ever stopped him in the street with gladsome looks. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year on Christmas Eve, Scrooge sat busily in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open so that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond a short of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. And so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Oh, Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew as he swept in from the cold outside. Bah said Scrooge. Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, what right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough? Scrooge, having no better answer on the spur of a moment, said... Uh. And again, followed it up with... Humbug. Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart, he should. Uncle! Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way, and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year where men and women seem, by one consent, to open their shut-up hearts freely, and to think of people below them as if they really were just fellow passengers to the grave, and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, Uncle, though it has not put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good, and will continue to do me good. And I say, God bless it. Bob Cratchit 
the clerk, involuntarily applauded. Let me hear another sound from you, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Uh, you're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we just be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never any quarrel, to which I have been a party. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left, stopping at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. <sighs> There's another fellow, my clerk, with 15 shillings a week and a wife and family talking about a Merry Christmas. Oh, I'll retire to Bedlam. This lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, he had let two other people in. They were portly, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the ladies, referring to her list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. Oh, it certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits at the ominous word liberality. Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses? Are they still in operation? They are. Still, I wish I could say they were not. <laughs> I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful cause. I'm very glad to hear it. A uh, few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, my fair lady, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I hope to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, it's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, my dear lady. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the ladies withdrew and Scrooge resumed his labors. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened. The cold became intense. The owner of one scant young nose stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol, but at the first sound of God bless ye merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror. You want all day tomorrow off, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work? Tis only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. Yes, sir. Scrooge walked out with a growl and went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. It was old enough now and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. 
Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face? It looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was an knocker again. To say that he was not startled would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished and turned it sturdily and walked in. He did pause with a moment's irresolution before he shut the door. And he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he had half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, <laughs> Poo -poo. and closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in, double locked himself in, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. Humbug. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell that hung in the room. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound. But soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bells ceased that they had begun. They were succeeded by a clanking noise, deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging heavy chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still. I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the door and passed into the room before his eyes. Same face. The very same. Pigtail, usual waistcoats, tights and boots. Marley? <laughs> Marley's ghost. The chain he drew clasped around his middle was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. How now? What do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice. No doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? Your particular for a shade. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you... can you sit down? I can do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair. You don't believe in me? I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. At this, the spirit shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair. But how much greater was this horror when the phantom took off the bandage around its head and its lower jaw dropped upon its breast. Mercy, dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do. I must. But why do spirits walk the earth? And why do they come to me? It is required of every man 
that the spirits within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, and is condemned to do so after death, and is doomed to wander through the world, oh, woe is me, it witness what it could not share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. Again, the specter shook its chain and wrung its shadowy hands. You're flattered. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it, link by link, and yard by yard. I girded it of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is this pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy as long as this. Seven Christmas Eves ago, you have labored on it since it is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor, in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty phantoms of iron cable, but he could see nothing. <sighs> Jacob, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirits never walked beyond our counting house, mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob. Slow? Seven years dead, and traveling all the time. The whole time. No rest, no peace. Incessant torture of remorse. You might have gotten over a great quantity of ground in seven years. Oh, captive, bound in double irons not to know that ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures must pass into eternity before the good is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I. Oh, such was I. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. At this time of the rolling year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raised them to that blessed star, which led the wise man to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Hear me, my time is nearly gone. I will. How it is that I appear before you in a shape that you can see, I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. That is no light part of my penance. I am here tonight to warn you that you have a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope, Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. Oh, I... I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. C couldn't I take them all at once and, and have it over, Jacob? Expect the second one, the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that for your own sake. You remember what has passed between us. The apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open and the specter floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked as he had locked it with his own hands and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but 
stopped at the first syllable. And being whether from the fatigues of the day or the dull conversation of the ghost and the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep upon the instant. Stave two, the first of three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. When the chimes of a neighboring church struck the four quarters, he listened for the hour. Twelve? It was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong. An icicle must have gotten into the works. Twelve? Why, it is impossible that I could have slept through a whole day and found to another night. It is impossible that anything has happened to the sun and that this is twelve at noon. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold. Scrooge went to bed again and remembered on a sudden that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell told one. He resolved to lie awake until the hour was past. At length, it broke upon his listening ear. A quarter past. A half past. A quarter to it. The hour itself. And nothing else. He spoke before the hour bell sounded. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge found himself face to face with another unearthly visitor. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair was white, as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, th the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and uh, what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? Your past. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, and that bed was warm, and that he was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown, and nightcap. The grasp, though gentle, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made toward the window, clasped his robe in supplication. I am mortal and am liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road. The entire city had vanished. Good heaven, I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. You recollect the way? Remember it? I could walk it blindfold. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree. Oh, some shaggy ponies were now seen trotting toward them with boys upon their backs who shouted gleefully to each other. These are but shadows of things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas! What good has it ever done to him? The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. My... Uh... I know. They left the high road by a well-remembered lane, and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick, with a little couple on the roof, and a bell hanging in it. They went to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made barer still by lines of desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge wept to see his poor, forgotten self as he used to be. The spirit touched Scrooge on the arm and pointed to his younger self, intent upon his reading. Why, it's Ali Baba. It's dear old honest Ali Baba. Yes, yes, I know. And his wild brother, there they go. And the sultan's groom turned upside down by the genie. There he is upon his head. Served him right. I'm glad of it. What business had he to be married to the princess? To hear Scrooge expending all the earnestness of his nature on such subjects in a most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying, and to see his heightened and exciting face would have been a surprise to his business friends in the city indeed. Oh, poor Robin Crusoe, he called him when he came home again after sailing around the island. Poor Robin Crusoe, where have you been, Robin Crusoe? The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was the parrot, you know. Then... With the rapidity of transition very foreign to his usual character, he said, in pity of his former self, Poor oh boy. I wish. Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket and looking about him. 
after drying his eyes with his cuff. But it's too late now. What is the matter? Laughing, laughing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. Then let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct that everything had happened so, that there he was, alone again when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, and with a mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously toward the door. It opened, and a little girl much younger than the boy came darting in, putting her arms around his neck and often kissing him, addressing him as her, Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home, dear brother, to bring you home, home. Home? little fan yes home for good and all home for ever and ever father is so much kinder than he used to be that home is like heaven he spoke so gently to me one dear night when i was going to bed that i was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home and he said yes you should and sent me in a coach to bring you and you're to be a man and you are to never come back here but first we're to be together all christmas long and have the merriest time in the world <laughs> you are quite a woman little fan Always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered. But she had a large heart. So she had. She died a woman and had children. One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city, where here too it was Christmas time again. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. No, it was I apprenticed here. They went in and at the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig. Scrooge cried in great excitement. Why, it's old Fezziwig, bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hand and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice. Yo ho there, Ebenezer, Dick. Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure. Bless me, yes. There he is, poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo-ho, my boys. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve. Dick. Christmas. Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three. Had them up in their places. Four, five, six. Pinned them. Seven, eight, nine. And came back before you could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hilly ho! Cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho! Dick! Sure up! Ebenezer! It was done in a minute. The floor was swept and in came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin and the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there, all top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter. There were more dances, and there were more forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there were mince pies, and plenty of beer. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their station, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene and with his former self. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost. 
A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money. Um, it isn't that. What is the matter? No nothing particular. Something, I think. No, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. My time grows short. Quick! Again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now. A man in the prime of his life. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a mourning dress, in whose eyes there were tears. It matters little. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion, gain, engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, I have not changed towards you. You are changed. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No. Never. In what, then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, but with steadiness upon him, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? You think not? Ah, oh, no. I would gladly think otherwise if I could. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl, you who in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain, or choosing her, if for a moment you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do. And I release you. With a full heart, for the love of him you once were. You may, <laughs> the memory of what is past half makes me hope you will, have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him, and they parted. Spirit. Show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more. No more, no more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene in place, a room not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl so like that last that Scrooge believed it was the same, until he saw her, now a comely matron sitting opposite her daughter. There were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count. The consequences were uproarious beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily. But now a knocking at the door was heard and the children rushed to greet the father who came home laden with Christmas toys and presents. The shouts of wonder and delight with which the development of every package was received, the joy and gratitude and ecstasy, they were all indescribable alike. Well, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Yes. <laughs> How can I? Don't I know? Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up, and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, I hear, and there he sat alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you these were shadows of things that have been. They are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me. I cannot bear it. Take me back. Haunt me no more. Scrooge was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness and being again in his own bedroom had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Stave three, the second of the three spirits. 
Awaking in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with green that it looked a perfect grove from which every part bright gleaming berries glistened. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, red hot chestnuts, juicy oranges, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn and held it up high up to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come, come and know me better, man. Scrooge hung his head before this spirit. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were bare, and on its head it wore no other carving than a holly wreath, set here and there with shining icicles. You have never seen the like of me before. Never. Have never marched forth with the younger members of my family? Meaning, for I am very young. My elder brothers born in these later years? I don't think I have. I am afraid I have not. Have you many brothers, Spirit? More than 1,800. A tremendous for a family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is now working. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, and all vanished instantly. So did the room, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning. The people, who were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another, now and then exchanging a facetious snowball. The sight of these revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for she sprinkled incense on those who carried fruit and dinner from her torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, their good humor was restored directly, for they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day, and so it was! God love it, so it was! Is there a particular flavor in what you sprinkle from your torch? There is. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? To any kindly given. To a poor one most. Oh, why to a poor one most? Because it needs it most. Spirit, I wonder you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I. You would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often the only day on which they can be said to dine at all, wouldn't you? I. You seek to close these places on the seventh day, and it comes to the same thing. I seek. Forgive me if I am wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family. There are some upon this earth of yours who lay claim to know us, and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that, and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on straight to Scrooge's clerks, and on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of her torch. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table. What has ever got your precious father then? said Mrs. Cratchit. And your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha, weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour? Here's Martha, mother, said young Peter, appearing as he spoke. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late are you? We had a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind. So long as you are come, sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless ye. No, 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 no there's father, there's father coming. coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. 
Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha came out from behind the closet door and ran into his arms. Oh, father. Oh, <laughs> Martha, my girl. <laughs> and how did little Tim behave? As good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest bird of all, a feathered phenomenon. And in truth, it was something very like that in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody. At last, the dishes were set on and grace was set. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit prepared to plunge into the breast. But when she did, one murmur of delight arose all around and even Tiny Tim beat on the table and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. I don't believe there was ever such a goose cooked. It's tenderness and flavor. And cheapness. <laughs> Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. At last, the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner, in a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, oh, no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief, but he raised his ears speedily on hearing his own name. A toast to Mr. Scrooge. I'll give you, Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. <laughs> the founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind. My dear, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do. My dear, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry, I have no doubt. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for a full five minutes. They were not a handsome family. They were not well-dressed, for their clothes were scanty, but... They were happy. Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim until the last. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold her robe and passing on the moor sped whither? It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize their destination as his own nephews, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. <laughs> Laughed Scrooge's nephew. <laughs> Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he and their assembled friends. He said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, he believed it too. I'm more shame for him, Fred. He's a comical old fellow, that's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I am sure he is very rich, at least you always tell me so. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any go with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking he's ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims, himself always. I give him the same chance every year whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. 
After a while, they played at forfeits. For it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. There was first a game at Blind Man's Buff. Of course there was. Scrooge's niece was not one of Blind Man's Buff Party. But at the game of how, when, and where, she was very great, and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew, beat her sisters. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for wholly forgetting that his voice made no sound in their ears, he sometimes came out with his guests quite loud and very often guessed quite right. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favor that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guest departed. But this, the spirit said, could not be done. Here is a new game. One half hour, spirit. Only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the rest must find out what, he only answering to their questions, yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal. <laughs> does it growl or grunt? <laughs> Sometimes. Well, does it live in London? It lives in London and walks about the streets. Yes or no only, Fred. Yes. So it doesn't live in a zoo or menagerie? No. They further determined that the beast was never killed in a market and was not a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? It's your Uncle Scrooge. Which it certainly was. He has given us plenty of merriment, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nonetheless. Uncle Scrooge. It was a long night, if it were only a night. The ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change and noticed that its hair was gray. Are spirits lives so short? My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight, at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, but I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it. Look here. From the foldings of its robe, it brought two children. Wretched, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment, where graceful you should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints. A stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Spirit, are they yours? They are man's, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. Beware them both. Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Stave four. The last of the spirits. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached, and in the very air seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand. You're about to show me the shadows of the things that have not yet happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. But will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to be, I, I know. Lead on, spirit. 
Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them. The spirits stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Inquired another. Um, last night, I believe. <laughs> Why? What was the matter with him? Asked a third, taking a vast quantity of snuff out of a very large snuff box. <laughs> I thought he'd never die. <laughs> God knows. What has he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. <laughs> It's likely to be a very cheap funeral. For upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if lunch is provided. Scrooge knew them and looked toward the spirit for an explanation. The phantom glided on into a street. Its finger pointed to two persons. Scrooge listened again, thinking that the explanation might lie here. He knew these women also perfectly. They were women of business, very wealthy and of great importance. He had made a point of always standing well in their esteem, in a business point of view, that is, strictly in a business point of view. How are you? Said one. Well, old Scratch has got his own at last, hey? So I am told. Cold, isn't it? Seasonable for the Christmas time. You're not a skater, I suppose. No, no, something else to think of. Good morning. Not another word. That was their meeting, their conversation, and their parting. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversations apparently so trivial. They could scarcely be supposed to have any meaning on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost province was the future. Nor could he think of anyone immediately connected with himself to whom he could apply them. He looked about in that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. Dark and quiet, beside him stood the phantom with its outstretched hand. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of town where Scrooge had never penetrated before, although he recognized its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow. The shops and houses were wretched, the people half naked, drunken, slipshod, and ugly. Far in this den of infamous resort, there was a low browed, beetling shop. Where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. Upon the floor within were piled heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, and refuse iron of all kinds. Sitting among the wares he dealt in was a gray haired rascal, nearly seventy years of age, smoking his pipe in all the luxury of calm retirement. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black, who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon the recognition of each other. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. Let the charwoman alone to be the first cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance if we haven't all met here without meaning it. You couldn't have met in a better place, said old Joe, removing his pipe from his mouth. Come into the parlor. The woman who had already spoken threw her bundle on the floor and sat down in a flaunting manner on a stool, crossing her elbows on her knees and looking with a bold defiance at the other two. What odds, then? Every person has the right to take care of themselves. He always did. That's true indeed, said Mrs. Dilbert, the laundress. No man more so. Who's the worst for a loss of few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No indeed. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw why wasn't a natural in his lifetime. If he had been, he'd had been someone to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out alone by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoke. 
It's a judgment on him. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor am I afraid to see it. We know pretty well that we're helping ourselves before we met here. I believe it's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. But the man in faded black, mounting the breach first, produced his plunder. It was not extensive. A seal, a pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value. They were severally examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked the sums he was disposed to give for each upon the wall, and added them up into a total when he found there was nothing more to come. That's your count, and I wouldn't give it another sixpence. Who's next? Mrs. Dilber was next. Sheets and towels, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of silver tongs, and boots. Her count was stated on the wall in the same manner. I always give too much to the ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself. That's your account. And if you ask me for another penny and made it an open question, I repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. And now, undo my bundle, Joe. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening it, and having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call these? Bed curtains? Bed curtains? You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, within the line there. Yes, I do. Why not? I certainly shan't hold my hand when I get anything in it by reaching out. For the sake of such a man he was, I promise you, Joe, don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. I his blankets? He isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. <laughs> I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? <laughs> Don't you be afraid of that. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. Ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it. Best he had. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. And what do you call a wasting of it? Putting it on him to be buried and to be sure. Somebody was a fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. If Calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it isn't enough for anything. It's quite becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Spirit, I... I see. I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed, on which beneath a ragged sheet lay a something covered up, which, though it was dumb, announced itself in awful language. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced toward the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. He lay in the dark, empty house, with not a man, a woman, or a child to say that he was kind. Spirit, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. Still, the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger to the head. I understand you, and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, Spirit. I have not the power. Again, it seemed to look upon him. If there is any person in this town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing, and withdrawing it, revealed a room by daylight where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone, and with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, started at every sound, looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, tried, but in vain, to work with her needle, and could hardly bear the voices of the children in their play. At length, the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. Is it good? She said. Or bad? Bad. Her husband answered. We're quite ruined. No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, there is. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. He is past relenting. He is dead. She was a mild and patient creature if her face spoke the truth. But she was thankful in her soul to hear it, and she said so with clasped hands. She prayed forgiveness the next moment and was sorry, but the first was the emotion of her heart. To whom will her debt be transferred? I don't know, but before that time, I shall be ready with the money. 
We may sleep tonight with light hearts, Caroline. Yes, softened as they would, their hearts were lighter. The children's faces, hushed and clustered round to hear what they so little understood, were brighter, and it was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him, caused by the event, was one of pleasure. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death. All that dark chamber spirit, which we just left now, will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet, and as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet. Very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The color hurts my eyes. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these few last evenings, mother. They were very quiet again. At last she said in a steady, cheerful voice that only faltered once, I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder, very fast indeed. And so have I, often. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so, that it was no trouble, no trouble, and there is your father at the door. Bob was very cheerful with them, and spoke pleasantly to all the family. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. My little child. He left the room and went upstairs into the room above, which was lighted cheerfully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the child. Poor Bob sat down in it. And when he thought a little and composed himself, he kissed the little face. He was reconciled to what had happened and went down again quite happy. They drew about the fire and talked, the girls and mother working still. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely seen but once, and who, meeting him in the street that day and seeing he looked a little down, inquired what had happened to distress him. Scrooge's nephew, Fred, said that if I can be of service to you in any way, pray come to me. And he gave me his card. It seemed really as if he knew our tiny little Tim. I'm sure he's a good soul. However and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget poor tiny Tim. Never, Never father. father. And I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was little, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves. And forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. No. no, never, father. Never, father. Mrs. Cratchit kissed him. His daughters kissed him. The two young Cratchits kissed him. And Peter and himself shook hands. Spirit of tiny Tim, thou childish essence, was from God. Spectre, someone informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me, what man that was whom we saw laying dead? The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him, as before until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. The squad through which we hurry now is where my place of occupation is and has been for a long time. I see the house. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. The house is yonder. Why do you point away? No change. Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom pointed as before. He joined it once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied it until they reached an iron gate. He paused to look around before entering. A churchyard. Here and then the wretched man, whose name he had now to learn, lay underneath the ground. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw a new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw near to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. 
are these the shadows of things that will be? Or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Still, the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if preserved in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was as immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit, oh, no, no, spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all thieves shall shrive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Stave 5. The End of It The bedpost was his own. Oh, the bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own. To make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, oh, Jacob, on my knees. He had been sobbing violently in his conflict with the spirit, and his face was wet with tears. They are not torn down, cried Scrooge, folding one of his bed curtains in his arms. They are not torn down, rings and all. They are here. I am here. The shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. His hands were busy with his garments all this time, turning them inside out, putting them on upside down, tearing them, mislaying them, making them parties to every kind of extravagance. I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel. I am as merry as a schoolboy. I'm as giddy as a drunken man. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Hello there. Whoop, hello. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There's the corner which the ghost of Christmas present sat. There's the window where I saw the wandering spirit. It's all here. It's all true. It all happened. <laughs> Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist. Clear, bright, jovial, stirring cold. Cold, piping for the blood to dance to. Golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet, fresh air, merry bells. Oh, glorious, glorious. What's today? Cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Eh. What's today, my fine fellow? Returned the boy with all his might of wonder. Today? Why, Christmas is today. I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Do you know the poulterers in the next street by one at the corner? A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here, that I may give them direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes, and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. A shot no, he sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did, somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. As he stood there waiting for his arrival, the knocker caught his eye. Oh, I shall love it as long as I live. Here's the turkey. Hello, hoop, who, how are you? Merry Christmas. Why, oh, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town. You must have a cab. 
The chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, were only to be succeeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again, and chuckled till he cried. He dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present. And walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded everyone with a delighted smile. Good morning, madam. A merry Christmas to you. Scrooge beheld the portly ladies who had walked into his counting house the day before and said, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe? My dear lady. Said Scrooge, quickening his pace and taking the old ladies by both hands. How do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A merry Christmas to you, madam. Mr. Scrooge? That is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness? Here Scrooge whispered in her ear. Lord bless me! My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, not a farthing left. And a great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favor? My dear sir, I don't know what to say to such... Don't say anything. Please, come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will. Thank you. I am much obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash and did it and was soon greeted by the maid. Is your master at home, my dear? Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room. Thank you. He knows me. Said Scrooge with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. Fred! Why, bless my soul. Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? It's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came in. So did the plump sister when she came in. So did everyone when they came in. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. Scrooge was early at the office next morning to be there first to catch Bob coming in late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello. Growled Scrooge in his accustomed tone, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind on my time. I... Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was rather making merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, and therefore I'm about to raise your salary. Bob trembled. A Merry Christmas, Bob. Said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon, Bob. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another I, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend and as good a man as the good old city knew. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good at which some people did not have their fill of laughter. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our recorded reading of A Christmas Carol. We put in a lot of hard work and dedication into this, you know, with how crazy things are. 
Um, it was kind of hard, but we got it all together. We love the story because it reminds us of what is really important in life. Sharing our gifts, giving back to our community, treasuring the time we spend with family, and being grateful for what we have. Scrooge, of course, had to be terrorized by ghosts in the night before learning to share. But we all learn differently. This winter season, whether you or your family celebrate the holidays or just time together, remember to reach out to those you care about and spread a little love and cheer. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching our production at Christmas Carol. It means so much to our class and Mr. Pankratz. And I just want to wish you and your family a happy holidays. Thank you so much once again. The holidays may look different this year, but we can still enjoy each other and the things that we're lucky to have. From all of us at Cab Players, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us. Merry Christmas. Thank you, and have a happy holiday. Tell your family you love them. Happy holidays, and thank you so much. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas, and happy holidays. Have a happy